Great, thanks. Um, so I want to thank uh, Dr. David Zolzer uh, for helping out in uh, interviewing Dr. Rout on the percutaneous stabilization of U-shaped sacral fractures using ilocecal screws techniques and uh, early results. So we will uh, play Dr. Rout's video and then please ask any questions in the Q&A section um, and we'll uh, hear from Dr. Rout with any thoughts and uh, comments he has after the video. So today I'm speaking with Dr. Chip Rout from the University of Texas in Houston uh, to discuss his paper uh, that was published in 2001 entitled Percutaneous Stabilization of U-Shaped Sacral Fractures Using Iliosacral Screws, uh, published on the Early Techniques and Results. Dr. Rout, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us about your early experiences and what made you want to do this study? Well, this paper was published in 2001 and actually tracked back before that for a cohort of patients. And I saw my first patient with a displaced, uh, unstable U-shaped sacral fracture that I recognized in 1990. And uh, fortunately, it was a traumatic spondyloptosis so that it was really obvious, but it was in a morbidly obese young guy. And he had neurological findings in his feet that really alerted us to the problem. We couldn't see it on his plane films except for a lateral sacral view. And it took three exposures in the, uh, because of his size to identify it. And then, of course, we saw it in the CT scan. So he was our first patient to really alert us to that. And then reviewing the literature in the early 90s wasn't quite as simple as it is today. And it became pretty obvious that this diagnosis existed in people, but it just had never really been published except in one textbook I could find an account of bilateral sacral fractures with displacement. It was in John Conley's uh, textbook and it recommended spicocasta, spicocasting treatment for this. Two of our patients early on in the 90s with not so much displacement led to the screw fixation. We had, uh, or I had two patients that I treated with bracing that developed um, neurological problems. They went from being neurologically normal to having one had uh, really dramatic cardioquina symptoms as a result of the displacement of what was previously a minimally displaced fracture in clinic when he came back in two weeks with neurological findings, he had fairly significant displacement. So that drove us to trying to find a way to do something simple to stabilize. And how has your practice changed since 2001 when this study was published? Well, in 2001, we didn't have long iliosacral screws. So all we had was screws up to 130 millimeters. And we first started using 6.5 fully threaded screws. Then when cannulated screws came about, we started using those, but they, they were limited out at 130. So if you notice in the paper, the, the screws go from left to right and right to left to in an attempt to lock threads. So we were doing the best we could to use iliosacral screws to hold it. But you can imagine we didn't have uh, screws beyond 130 millimeters until 2006. So that was even five years after this uh, study was published. And this cohort of patients came from even before then. So Any other limitations of the technique that you found uh, in your years of doing? Well, the limitations would be if there's not a safe pathway for the screws to be inserted. And um, fortunately for most patients, there are almost always safe pathways. We are rarely find a patient with uh, osteology and injury deformity that obviates the ability to put in uh, safe iliosacral screws. The technique has evolved into um, long transsacral screws as many as you can put safely into the conduit of bone, the, oper the area of opportunity. And then depending on where the transverse limb is, if the transverse limb is at the S1, S2 area, then we tend to just use the fixation in the upper sacral segment. If the transverse limb is at S2, uh, then we can use screws at S1 and S2 in those pathways. And then it, if it's a U, a pure U, then we just use iliosacral screws. If it's a Y or a backwards Y or a H, then that gets into fixing the anterior ring as well, and then um, maybe adding on level pelvic. And which, for which patients are you consulting with your spine colleagues? Well, we we have a good symbiotic relationship, uh, and so 
we'll, I'll discuss almost everyone with them just to make sure that it's not something that they think needs to have additional lumbar pelvic fixation. But typically, it's the uh, really severe H's and Y's and backwards Y's. For almost all the U sacral fractures, the spine surgeons don't uh, get involved unless there's some need to do acute decompressions uh, as a result of the, the neurological findings. If a patient has a neurologic uh, lesion, uh, have you found it to have any effect on that? I'm sure. Your experience. Yeah, so if, if you find, if a patient presents and the diagnosis is made in, in a temporally reasonable manner, like acutely, and they have some type of positional neurology, for example, we had a lady that came into the clinic not too long ago, and she was sent from our spine uh, colleague. And when she would stand up and walk around, she had fallen several weeks earlier, three or four weeks earlier, and she was okay for a week or so, but then for the last week or so, she wasn't okay. When she would walk, she would lose a sensation in her feet, and her feet would, she would get like foot drops on both sides, and her instability was very, or her neurology was positional. And you can treat those patients early, help them with the reduction by just putting them uh, in a good position in the operating room, and then stabilize them. And then that way they don't have this instability that's related to to the neurological finding. And how successful do you think we are now at identifying these patients in an appropriate time point and treating them? Hey, do you still see deficiencies in your practice where patients are referred to you late with unrecognized injuries? Yeah, so the, the acute ones from high energy trauma are, are caught. I think everyone's pretty alert to the paradoxical inlet now in the emergency centers across the globe. I think the paradoxical inlet is a real thing for the displaced ones. I think the, uh, the advent of CT scans in the trauma patient picks up, I would say, almost 100% of these. Uh, the, the patient population is still having a lot of delayed or misdiagnoses is the elders who fall, and they get uh, pretty much pushed away. And so we still see, you know, sometimes I just had a lady who had fallen two months earlier and had neurological changes and the diagnosis was still missed um, until she finally found our, her way to someone who can see the diagnosis. I've also had patients who've been to four different emergency rooms, you know, over a two week period uh, recently trying to just get care uh, where the diagnosis was not identified. Either in certain situations they weren't imaged uh, or they were not identified on the images or they just finally uh, got a CT scan and, and, ident and identified it. So, but not, not so much in the young trauma patients that I think, I think most of those get found. You're still bracing your patients postoperatively after fixation, and when are you uh, usually letting them weight bear? So we used HTLSOs because we had to go down to the hip, and those were pretty cumbersome. We used hinged hip thoracic lumbar sacral orthoses, and those were custom made for the patients. And, uh, some of them were compliant and some of them weren't, and it was a mess. Uh, I think with the advent of improved technique and also implants, once we got screws that were long enough to give us transsacral fixation, and we started learning more and more about filling up the pathways with multiple screws at multiple levels when possible, then we had improved stability. And then we also added lumbar pelvic uh, stabilization when that's necessary, so we don't use braces anymore. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Dr. Ralph, for being here. Um, it doesn't look like any questions have popped up through the Q&A box. Um, I do have um, a couple questions for you and then uh, maybe any comments you have. Um, one is, um, what are your thoughts on non-displaced uh, new type sacral fractures? Um, and if you attempt any kind of mobilization and see if there's any displacement or if you think those are indicated for operative fixation. And then the second part of the question is um, really in the, in the elderly population, what your thoughts are uh, regarding this injury. I think most of the patients in your, um, in your article here were young, um, higher energy uh, patients. And I, I think we're starting to see a little bit more of a trend of the geriatric uh, fractures and catching these um, U-type sacral fractures as well in that population. Well, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me. And I'm uh, glad to be here. I, I want to just say that so many things have changed since 2001 when the manuscript was uh, published. And uh, to answer your question, uh, elders have been having these fractures for as long as we've had elders. There's no new phenomenon to elders now getting fractures. Uh, 
people have been having these fractures since the beginning of time. We're just a little keener to them now, and I think we have to listen to the patients. We, uh, we have a patient right now pending a surgery who uh, likely was not going to have a surgery if you just can't recognize the injury. So I, I would just say that it's not a new phenomenon. It's just that people are more aware of it at sure. least from an orthopedic trauma standpoint. We have flooded the market with orthopedic trauma surgeons. So, of course, people are looking for things to do, and these identi they get identified. So, um, and as far as non-displaced closed management, you can certainly try non-displaced non or minimally displaced uh, fractures with no, with no treatment at all. And as long as they're stable, uh, they'll stay right there. But you don't really have a crystal ball and I sure don't. And I don't know which ones are going to change and which aren't. And I don't have a way to clinically correlate the ones that hurt worse are going to displace and the ones that don't hurt so bad won't. I, I don't have a clinical or a radiographic or a, any type of way to predict the future on a, essentially non-displaced you that has come to the ER for help because they're hurting really badly. So usually that's what brings them to the hospital is they're hurting really badly. So uh, I would just say it's been my practice uh, since we got safe with iliosacral screws in the early 90s, and then especially since we got longer screws to treat all of those patients that I identify if they are safe for anesthesia because stabilization almost always prevents later displacement. It gives them essentially immediate comfort. The patients will go from an 8 to 9 out of 10 to a 3 uh, pretty much immediately. So I think the, the comfort... Uh, that helps them get off analgesia and allows them to be mobilized straight away is a really good benefit. So uh, I, I wouldn't say all, but I would say almost all. And I think one of the questions that was added, uh, asked right at the end of the, the talk, I don't think we got to it, is about the weight-bearing status. So what is your typical protocol uh, for, um, for these patients from weight-bearing standpoint? Mm -hmm. So my wants and what I get are two different things. It's a whole lot like <laughs> life. What I wish for sure. and what I ask for, it's like raising children. You can tell them what to do and then they'll do what they damn well please, especially in the state, great state of Texas. So <laughs> in, uh, I will tell you in Seattle, people are pretty compliant, but in uh, Texas, people are not. And so our patients essentially do whatever they feel like doing. And I, I think if I was an elder with this injury, I would do whatever my comfort allowed. Uh, and usually that's uh, some type of protected weight bearing. It's a tandem protected weight bearing that use a walker, but as soon as their comfort allows, they're usually on a cane or something like that. So we don't, we don't usually restrict their activities. We encourage them to use a walker and do a tandem weight bear, but uh, usually they're pretty much doing whatever they feel comfortable doing. And usually the stability extrapolates to the comfort. Last question is about um, dysmorphic. If you have a dysmorphic sacrum, um, are those kind of in the situations where you have to start thinking about more about lumbopelvic fixation if the U is going between S1 and S2 or? So not necessarily. We were just reviewing a case earlier today, uh, uh, me and Dr. Garlic, and we uh, showed it was a patient who in uh, August of uh, 2018 had had a, a lot about with abdominal pain and she had had a, a CT scan as a part of her abdominal evaluation and she was an absolute dysmorph. And then about two months later, she fell and she got a displaced U and she was no longer a dysmorph. And so what happens with the dysmorphs when they break and they collapse and they displace and they intrude, then usually what used to be a dysmorph is not so much of a dysmorph. So for the younger people, maybe a little different, but for the olders, a lot of times who is a dysmorph becomes uh, optimal for transsacral. But if they, again, just like we said in the video, if they don't have a conduit of safety for a transsacral screw and you totally understand the radiographic imaging and the conduits and where the screws need to go and you see that, then that's not a good candidate, whether they're young or old or whatever they are. If there's no conduit for the screw, then there's no screw and we have lumbopelvic available. So then those patients do get lumbopelvic. It's just a more extensive surgery, but if that's what they need, that's what they get. Sure. Um, any other further comments you wanted to provide Dr. Rout before we move on? No, I think Dr. Burgess just sort of left uh, a question hanging about uh, what was what type of classification scheme do we oh, yeah. do yeah. Now, nowadays? And I would just say we do a hybrid of his and 
Dr. Pinal's and then just Letourneau's anatomical classification. So I, I really like to know the details of the anatomy of what areas of the bone are injured and what their deformity and displacements are. So that usually takes us uh, to where we are. So the APC2 or whatever can give us that, but then I want to know specifically what areas of the anatomy. Is the symphysis pure? Or is it parasymphyseal? Is it a combination of fracture dislocation? Things like that. So we, we blend in uh, anatomy so that we have really good communication uh, with the classification scheme that Dr. Burgess described. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me.